you've got your Bibles, I'd like to turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. I'd like to finish 10 and maybe move on into 11 a little bit. A little bit more controversial passage. Um, I hope that as I send your reminders out or, uh, later in the week that you guys are spending some time in the Word and, and seeing where we're going together so that we can uh, kind of come in and be on the same page as one another. Um, so we've been going through the book of, of 1 Corinthians. We've been uh, talking about a lot of things. And over the past several months, we've talked about being a hospital. And we've talked about how this looks. And really, we haven't left the hospital conversation. Um, we've just been kind of going through. And I don't know if you've seen it, but I've seen it where the church needs a hospital. <laughs> you know, as we walk through things together, we're seeing where the hospital is needed. And, and I, I just want to say that I'm, one of those things that, that just keeps hitting me is that uh, the spiritual hospital is so much different than the physical hospital. At times, the physical hospital is that thing where we go to because we don't have a choice. Can I get an amen? You know, you're taken there because you don't have a choice. It's interesting with, with Jesus, we have a choice, and our spiritual hospital is that we choose to go in it. Right? Now, we may have circumstances that push us, right? We may have, we may have circumstances that push us, but in all, in all actuality, uh, we're choosing to go in. And so... As we see this, this is why Paul's writing 1 Corinthians and, and 2 Corinthians as a response to things that the church needs to look at. And so, uh, so I just want to keep going in. We, I want to talk to you a little bit about what true freedom is and what false freedom is. Um, because I think it's, a, it's a, a distinction that needs to be made because um, false freedom leads to destruction. True freedom leads leads to peace. Um, it leads to, well, I was struggling all week with the words to come up. I, I think it's this. It's, we have true freedom, which is volunteered servitude to Jesus. We are free to choose to be a servant of Jesus. That's true freedom. You see, we're taught something totally different, especially in the Western culture, that freedom means I can do whatever I want, that I, I can walk out however I want. It doesn't matter. Um, I have freedoms and I have rights. Remember, we talked about that word. Paul uses that a lot. I have this right to do this. I have a right to do this and a right to do this, but I choose not to do that. Right? So he starts out with that slogan that was happening in the church that everything is permissible. But he says not everything is helpful. Everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. See, with, with true freedom, this is what happens in true freedom when we allow ourselves to, to voluntarily chain ourselves to the cross of Christ. When we become this bond slave, as Paul calls himself so often, as we walk in Jesus' footsteps, what happens is, is it builds ourselves up in the spirit, but also builds others that are around us. It can't help it, right? Have you ever been around a person who has just walked so much in the Lord? They're just walking in the Lord, and, 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 and you're trying not to puff them up so you don't say much, right? But every chance you get, you kind of want to be with them. Every chance you just kind of want to be near, hear what they have to say. Because it seems like every time that we hear these things and we see this person, all of a sudden, next thing we know, we're feeling, we're, we're building up. Our faith gets built. We're hearing stories about how, how um, God showed up in the midst of everything that was destroyed and just, boom, it was, it was freedom and it was he, all provision made. And, and our faith gets built. And, and that's what happens, but there's a warning that happens this way. And we talked a little bit about it last week, how slippery a slope that is when that person becomes an idol. We begin to look to that person for our spiritual growth instead of what, who we should be, which is, is, is God through Jesus empowered by the Holy Spirit. We, we, we understand this. And this is, he says, so everything is permissible. Then he says, no one should seek his own good, but the good of the other person. We could probably stop there and that phrase alone would be convicting enough. Right? Whatever you do in life, Look for the good of the other person and not yourself. In other words, you don't... 
I think we have a tendency in the church to come to God expecting God to do good for me. Now, God does do good for us. I'm not saying he don't. But I'm going to tell you why he does good. is so that you can turn around and do good for others. Because if we're focusing on where Jesus has walked and we're focusing on where he wants us to be, then all this other stuff just doesn't seem important. And so we begin to build up others. We begin to, to look for the good of someone. To me, that sounds like a pretty neat hospital, doesn't it? Where we could walk for the benefit. Now, it's not always received. It's not always received. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's not received but you keep doing it anyway. Sometimes you have to give a hard word because of you love someone, but it's not received the way the heart or where the Lord's wanting to it come. It just has come cross right. Um, it's a challenge with relationships, isn't it? So remember he was talking about offering or eating meat offered to idols last week. And he he goes into this. Now listen to what he says. Remember, he said, don't do it. You may have the right to do it, but don't do it because you will ruin the conscience of that person uh, that you're with and and that weaker person, right? Well, listen to what Paul says in the end of this. He says, eat everything that is sold in the meat market. Now remember, not only was the temple the cafe where you'd go get meat, but everything in the meat market in, in Corinth was meat that had been offered to idols. And so you really didn't have a choice. But he says, eat everything sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. He's saying, look, be, you know, when you're with somebody and, 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 and there's conversations, be, you don't want to ruin the conscience of somebody else. But he says, when you go to the meat market and you want a T-bone, don't ask where it came from. Right? Because what if? What if? Keep reading. I'm, he says, For the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. He says, So when you go to the meat market, don't ask the question. Now he's going to get on and, and talk to you about it. And he goes on to say a little bit if the one. Unbel- Is that better? Oh, good. That's much better. Okay. So he says, so if you go over to an unbeliever's house, he invites you over and you want to go eat everything that is set before you. I think it even means the broccoli. I'm not sure, but it says everything, so I'm going to go there. Without raising questions of conscience. Yeah, it didn't say anything about bananas, though. I'm reading between the lines. That can't mean that because that's nothing. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, so I'm just kidding. So anyway, he says like, look, don't ask the question where it comes from. And then I'm reading this thing going, Paul, why are you going on? And then it hit me. How many times in our life God has shown up, done something amazing, and we've questioned where it came from? Well, what if? How about this? When the Lord, see, I think sometimes we don't walk in confidence of who we are in the spirit. Because how many times have you done this? The Lord's given you a word, or the Lord's shown you something in Scripture, or the Lord, whatever, and you say, well, was that me or God? It's like we're, we're not trusting that God is who he says he is if we truly believe that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. Now, I'm not saying we don't use discernment. And, I'm, and I know that sometimes the enemy speaks into our head. But if we... And I believe this. All the gifts are available to us, especially discernment. Now, some of us walk in discernment better than others. Okay? Go on the freeway. You'll find it. But what I'm saying is is that we all have a discernment. If we're walking where God wants us to walk, we will know I should not go there. I should not be there. The problem is the doing. 
I was talking to, uh, I was watching a video, and I don't know, maybe I mentioned this last week. Uh, sometimes my brain gets all m- messed up. Um, but I was watching a YouTuber friend of mine, and, uh, not a friend, but somebody I watch a lot, so he seems like a friend. Anyway, he, he was like talking about eating well. And he says, here's the thing. Everybody knows how to, that they should eat well, right? I mean, we know. You can't say, well, I didn't know a salad was better than a candy bar. You know beyond a shadow of a doubt what is good, right? What is the problem then? Doing it. It's the same thing. I know. It's the same thing in the church. It's that simple. I am tired of a complicated gospel. Come on, y'all. God knows, and he's put in the heart of every man what is right and what is wrong. The enemy can come in and twist it. And the way we've been taught over the years can twist it. And, 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 and I understand that. But in the deep darkness of understanding, we know what is right and what is wrong. And that is something that we really got to take. Can we go to Psalms 24 real quick? Because I also believe the church uses a lot of excuses for why we don't do what we're supposed to do. Amen? And I want to read this passage of Scripture because I, I, I want you to, to hear where this, this quote comes for, from. It's Psalms 24. Uh, David is writing this. He, um, and, and remember, last week we talked about idols, uh, uh, pretty much idolatry versus his glory. So it says, The earth and everything in, in the world and all of its inhabitants belong to the Lord. Everybody say all. All the inhabitants of the earth belong to the Lord. Even those who aren't walking with the Lord. Come on, they belong to the Lord. They are made in his image. They are for his good pleasure, the Old Testament says. It all belongs to the Lord. Now listen. For he laid its foundations on the sea and established it on the rivers. Last week we talked about going through the sea, the baptism of understanding the exodus. He laid this on the foundation. The, and, and the sea is a lot of times is in the Old Testament is chaos and, and, and nuts. And it doesn't make sense. But God says, the Lord has laid the foundation of his kingdom on top of the chaos of life. I don't know about you, but that's peaceful. I mean, that's good stuff because no matter how it is, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God's kingdom is here and now. And it may look crazy, and it may look like we're going to sink. And it may look like we're going to fail, but if we just look for God's kingdom, we look for his people, we find ourselves rallying around one another, lifting each other up, building each other up, the chaos doesn't matter. It's that simple. Listen, he goes on to say this. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? We're going all the way to the Exodus story. We're going all the way to remember on the, on, on the mountain when there was a wedding to get ready to take place. God says, okay, I prepared everything. Now people come to the top of the mountain. And they said, no. He's saying, who can stand in these places? He says, the one with clean hands and a pure heart, who has not set his mind on what is false, and who has not sworn deceitfully. When I started looking up this, the word clean is free from, exempt, or, or innocent. The, our, the hands is a picture of what we do and how we act. It's faith. So with clean faith, a pure, innocent faith, and a pure heart, clean again, radiant, um, empty of pride, bright, clear conscience, middle, the inner man, the mind, that's heart. We put these together saying, an innocent mind, a mo- and, and the New Testament say, a mind that has been transformed by, or by a life that has been transformed by the renewing of the mind. He says, those are the people who will stand on the mountain of the Lord. And those are the people who will stand in his holy place. He says, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him who seek his face, O God of Jacob. You sing a song, let us be a generation that seeks to be in this place, to standing on the mountain, to be in this. And and then it's all of a sudden, it's like he busts out in a battle cry. He says, lift up your heads, you gates. 
the entryway, the source of. Raise up, O oh ancient doors, for then the king of glory will come in. And then they ask the question, well, who is this king of glory? And this is what he says. The Lord strong, the Lord mighty. Not just might, but mighty in battle. And then he repeats it again. And anytime something's repeated twice in scripture, we need to pay attention to. I'm saying, he's, he's saying, listen, you, you, you want to battle in life? You can't battle on your own. You're going to fail. But with Jesus, it don't matter how many times we swing a sledgehammer. It doesn't matter how many times we swing a sword. It doesn't matter. We will fail. We cannot gain ground because it is not who in ancient Israel, what they do? They sent out the choir before they sent out the soldiers. Because through the praises of the people, the glory of the Lord showed up, and the Ark of the Covenant would follow, and guess what? No one stood in the way. No one was swinging a sword, really. God did it for them. I think maybe the problem is, is that today, we feel like we are the ones who are supposed to swing. You know, Jesus in the New Testament said, go buy a sword. But he never said to swing it. He just said, just make sure you have one. Now, I don't know if God's ever going to change that. We know Israel went to battle, and we know that. But what I'm saying is, is when they focused on God, they always won. But when they focused on themselves, they always lost. Because if we focus on ourselves, we cannot have clean hands. We cannot have a pure heart. And our mind will be set on what is false. False freedom false rights and that will become our God and then that's what we will swear deceitfully towards think about it, we will swear deceitfully I have the right to do what I want that's what I'm swearing on I am, you know, we do this in America all the time I'm an American, these are my rights yeah, we are guaranteed praise the Lord, constitutional rights amen I'm glad we have them. But what if God said, lay them down for the glory of my kingdom? Would you do it? Whew. That's a tougher question, isn't it? But that's what he's saying. He's saying, are you willing? I, sometimes I think God just wants to know, are you willing? Are you willing to go there? Are you willing to say this? Are you willing to say that? Or are you going to say, no, God, I can't because? Our sister Beth gave us a great word before she sang, didn't she? Come on. She goes, I don't know if I, I can do this. I get, But she did it. And the Lord blessed and used her in it. Right? She was willing to go there. All right. Now, let's flip back to the Corinthians part here. So then he says this. So, okay, eat whatever you get at the meat market. If someone invites you, eat whatever's set before you. I probably means even bananas. Okay, okay, I'll give it to you, but I'm not going over to the Ludens. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, and then he says, but if someone says to you, this is a banana. I mean, this is an idol. Sorry. If someone says, well, that was close. If someone says, this meat was offered to an idol, don't eat. For conscience sake, for yours, no, it makes it very clear. Read it yourself. He says, no, for the, con for the other one. Because you don't know what influence you have over that person. You don't know that maybe God has sent you to that place so that you will be his light in a dark spot. You know, wherever we go in life, wherever we're sent, whatever happened, whether it's circumstances, whether it's God, whatever it is, just choices we've made, we have to believe if we're followers of Jesus that I am there for a reason and that I am there and I'm going to walk out that reason. I may not even like it and I may have a lot of, lot of even frustration with it, but I'm going to walk it out the best I can because that's where, because I believe that God's showing up. We have to understand that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And where he dwells, he is. I know that seems weird to even say that, but sometimes where he dwells, he is actually there, folks. 
but sometimes we don't live it. Sometimes we look in the mirror and we see our past and then we think there's no way God could live there. But you have been set aside for the purpose of the kingdom. And I believe that's for everybody, even those who don't know Jesus yet. God has a purpose and a plan for them. And God's just waiting. Sometimes he's waiting on them, but I wonder if sometimes he's waiting on the church to be the church. Hmm. Just a thought. So then he says this, for why is my freedom judged by another person's conscience? If I partake with thanks, why am I slandered because of something I give thanks for? And he's asking that question to the people who are really offended by eating food from idols. <laughs> he's saying, okay, I'm going to do, remember, he, gave, he, he threw his rights aside last chapter. He said, no, I'll put my rights down. He's not questioning that he should pick up those rights again. He's questioning the heart of those who are critical about it. He's questioning it saying, hey, I got food from the meat market. It was a ribeye about an inch and a half thick, and it was amazing, praise God. I don't care where it came from. I went over to, to my neighbor's house, and they had a huge barbecue, and it was amazing. I, didn't, I don't care where it came from. He did it. What well, says in 31? Therefore, a word again, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do or, or do everything for God's glory, whether you eat or don't eat, whether you go there or don't go there, whatever is God has convicted, convicted you of, do it for God's glory. That means don't be judgmental if someone's not following you. Because maybe they're not doing what you're doing for God's glory, just as you're doing what you're doing for God's glory. And I know, well, that just seems like chaos. And the Man, Holy Spirit's good enough to wind all this stuff out. And each of us are different people. And each of us needs something different. Each of us have a different story and a different testimony that we must be prepared to give because someone is waiting to hear. Do you understand that? Someone is ready to hear your story. And in that story is a relationship with Jesus. It's an opportunity of the filling of the Holy Spirit to be a follower of Jesus every time we give our testimony. This is why the Bible says, be ready in season and out. Right? Give no offense to the Jew or the Greek or the church of God, just as I also try to, to please all people in all things not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many so that they may be saved. Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. So Paul's saying the reason I walk this way is because it's the way Christ walked. He's saying this. He's saying, look, I will not do something offensive when I'm in front of the Jews if I know it offends them. People, that's called being intentional about our walk with Jesus. We have to be intentional and quit worrying about the profit. W quit worrying about what do I get out of the deal. You've already got everything you need out of the deal, and that's called a relationship with Jesus. And if that's not good enough, you need to check your heart. That may sound harsh, but I think when we get into 11 here in a second, which I can't believe I'm getting there, This is why he goes here. This part, first part of 11, has gone down in history as Paul's like, you know, you say one thing one time and you're labeled for life. Paul is addressing an issue here in Corinthians church and it's about head coverings. It's about men and women. It's in the church. And, 
and I'm going to read it, but I need you to help me help you understand what Paul's saying. So if you could please check all your pretenses of the scripture at the door. I mean, if you have to actually literally go to the door and like take out your brain, that's fine. What I'm asking you to do is listen to the whole thing before you get offended, especially ladies, okay? I know I'm a guy, but I didn't write it. And I think we've misunderstood it so bad that we use it for something that Paul never admitted. Paul is known as a woman hater. I think his club that he started was the He-Man Woman Haters Club, which carries on till this day. Um, but he wasn't. I believe he wrote Romans. At the end of Romans, he talks about a lady apostle. He talks about lady pastors and lady teachers and lady prophets. And he says, yes, and I do too. Right? But listen to what it says here. Now, I praise you that you've always remembered me and kept the uh, traditions just as I've delivered them to you. So Paul came and he started a church and he left some traditions. Okay, Why do I have that tradition? That thing in my head, I don't know. Um, but I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man. And that man is the head of the woman. And God is the head of Christ. Don't hate me. I'm glad. See, we didn't pass fruit out of the door. I think we're messed up here in our thinking about what this means. We automatically read this and we say, oh, it's a line of authority, which I think there's some authority. that God has authority in everything. But there's another term that the word head is always used for. Um, where, does it be, where does the river begin? We call it the head of the river, right? It's the source of the river. It's where it comes from. So he starts out saying, God is the source of man. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. Yeah. Then he says, then the next line he says what? And the man is the head of woman. The source of creation says what happened in the Garden of Eden. That woman was made from man, right? The source of. Then he says <clears throat> that, then he makes this note that says, and God is the source of Christ. Every man who prays and prophesies with something on his head dishonors his head, but every woman who prays and prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since that is one and the same as having her head shaved. So if a woman's head is not covered, her hair should be cut off. But if it is disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, should she be covered? She should be covered. So Paul goes down on a little rabbit trail here of tradition. Now, I want to give this a different spin. I want you to keep that source of where everything comes from in your head, okay? And then I want you to understand, he's talking about praying and prophesying. That's worship. That is worshiping God. And he's saying, listen, I want you to worship God with everything you have. I don't think he's saying, males get to worship differently than females. But in the culture, and if you go back to the end of this passage, he says, we have, we have no other custom, nor do the churches of God. He's saying, this is the custom of the church. This is tradition. He says, we don't have anything else. We don't, we don't have anything else. And so it's all about coming to God as who you are. Listen, whether your head's short or long, hair short or long, come to God as how he's created you to be. Whether it's male or female or whatever, come to God to worship. I think sometimes we come into worship, now follow me on this, we come into worship and we don't experience God's true worship because we're coming to God with pretenses of who we want to be and not who we really are. Like, I think God says, come in your brokenness. Come in your sin. Come who you are and give it to me and really understand what true worship is. Don't come to me with a false face that says you've got everything together. 
That is prideful, and that's going to cause you never to see the face of Jacob, of, of God, or the father of Jacob. You can't have true worship. So I want to stay away from the gender part of this, and I want to look at the fact is how we come through those doors makes every bit of difference how we see God inside. For instance, Exodus, my favorite book. I talk about it all the time. The priests, when they set up the tabernacle, they had to tie a rope around them because they just weren't quite sure that they were okay. Are you glad that we don't have like a little hitch rail out there and everybody ties themselves off before they come into church? What if you didn't have enough rope and it only got that far from the bathroom? You're in trouble. That's funny, right? But what if it's this much from the altar? We come in here, like I said, I believe in all the gifts. And I believe sometimes we don't use the gifts and we don't see the gifts mood because people are coming with a fake front. They're not coming with who God says they are. Because we forgot that our source is not our actions. It's not who we do. It's not who we're, what we do. It's not who we know. It's nothing like that. Our source is God and God alone. He is the head of all things. And in him, all things are his. Can, can you imagine with me if we were true when our, in our worship like 24-7? I know some of, I'm just saying uh, Miss Mary is not in here or she would really love this, but we have a tendency in the church. The reason I say that is because I get, I get excited sometimes and I rail on the church. And I know not everybody in the church uh, doesn't worship truthfully. I know that but all of us have an opportunity to and all of us sometimes depending on how our week's been we do can I be truly honest with you sometimes I've come up and preached a word with a false face on will you forgive me so can you forgive yourself because God wants to do something I would like to play a song for you. Now, we're not going to play the whole song because it's pretty long. So you'll need to just watch me, bud. But um, I really want you to listen to the words. Now, guys, you need to understand it's a very girly song. Okay? I don't do girly very often, but this one wrecked me. It's like the movie P.S. I Love You. It just slapped me in the face and I couldn't help but like it. And not one bullet got shot. Went to the doctor, asked if I was sick. I want us to listen to this. And then we're going to finish out this thing. I'm telling you. To understand true worship, we've got to understand this. That's how God sees us. It doesn't matter what we've done or where we've come from. He says, Bring them to me. And when you begin to understand this and you begin to look at the rest of this passage, it opens up so much because he's talking about the head and the, the glory of women's uh, hair and all this, and it's very cultural. And he talks about how you know, man didn't come from woman, but m woman came from man. And it talks about how th this creation part is that because if you think about this, and this is such a beautiful thing, when God saw man that he was alone, he said, it is not good. To complete my creation, I have to have a helpmate for him. I have to have someone who comes along. Now, I understand that God sometimes calls people into relationship to not have intimate, to, to not have earthly intimacy. And, 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 and so it's just, God and them. And that's really hard because sometimes people misunderstood this. You know, they're not old spinsters. They've been called to a reason so that they can do what God has called them to be, and it's okay. You know, I don't believe that there's one for every person out there. Because God is for every person out there. 
And I don't care where you are in your marriage if things are falling down and you don't think you have a helpmate there. Let me tell you, God is still there and he's still there to complete you. This is an example of how it's supposed to be. I don't even believe we can come to true worship without that understanding. Verse 11 says, In the Lord, women are not independent of man, and man is not independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man uh, comes through the woman, and all things come from God. I think what he's really trying to say is don't get caught up in things. This is the only custom we have. Praise the Lord. So this does not mean that guys should not wear a ball cap in church. There. Biblical, right there. It doesn't mean that women need to come in and before they, they I was going to bring, I have, a, I have a prayer shawl and, and some stuff uh, from our Jewish roots I was going to bring, and I just didn't. And I, it doesn't mean that, oh, this is how it's supposed to be. We are sealed in the Holy Spirit. We are already covered. Our glory is not our own glory. Our glory comes from Jesus Christ. I think what Pastor Jason and what Beth was talking about today is that he wants to take us out of that cage and out of that shame and bring us into his light. But I just, I just want to get really real today. Team, you can come on up. I want to get really real. See, I believe, you know, uh, I've been laughing over the past few weeks. We've been low on numbers and, and we've got people out and people sick and this and that and a whole bunch of other things and, and the weather is just like beautiful like today is the only beautiful day we've had in a week right <laughs> yeah picnic looked really great this morning um, but I think I, I, I begin to, to say God you know well I just gotta be honest with you I am so excited about what God's doing in this place uh, I haven't been this excited uh, uh, about things. I'm just going to be real, real. I haven't been this excited about things since, um, well, um, I can go back to when we first started the church. I was pretty darn excited. I'm, I'm there plus now. And the reason I'm there right now is because I believe God is, is, is bringing about a true intimacy between us and him. And then this true intimacy, we can, we can, we can strive all we want, but we're going to realize we're going to come undone. I'm not saying we don't walk in, in righteousness. I don't think, I, I think we still have to do our part, right? This is not a free ride kind of message. This is a, a message that says we still have to walk the way he's called us to walk. But when I mess up, I don't have to beat myself over the head because I am who uh, he says I am. And um, I believe God really wants us to worship him. And I believe that people who have been here the last several weeks to hear the messages are here by divine appointment. And I think what we need to understand is God is asking us to shed. Shed the pretenses of our worship. Like, I'm serious. Why is it that we have to put on a false smile when we walk in here? Why can't we just say what it is? Life is hard, and I don't understand it, but God does, and I'm going to be here like I was all week, listening to him, worshiping him, praising him, and now I get to come into a place where I'm in the same boat as everybody else in here, and they understand, and so when I'm weak, they can be my strength, and when they're weak, I can be their strength, because the truth of of all of it is that we 
have to have our worship or we have nothing. Without our worship, the enemy will come in and kill, steal, and destroy anything that you think you have built up in your life. Whatever you possess that you hold dear, he will steal it from you, the enemy will. Whether it's people, whether it's relationships, it doesn't matter. He will. And especially when his people have put their hands down and quit worshiping God. It's like this is holding him back. But when we do this, the enemy comes in like a flood. Worship isn't magic. It's intimacy. How is it that the only time we actually worship is when we come here? Sometimes I wonder if, if, if we take the, the, the word literally, I wonder how many of our lives there's a whole bunch of rocks crying out because we won't. Maybe it's time we cried out, church. Maybe it's time we cried out, Lord, it's all falling apart, but I don't care because you're still up there. You're still ruling and reigning. I'm good. Maybe, maybe we need to get to a point where it's like, Lord, you have blessed me so much. I don't deserve your blessing. We always say, well, I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve that. Yeah, we all understand that. But we don't deserve his blessings either. We don't deserve the gifts he's given. He de we don't deserve any of that. But God says, even though my bride is broken and disturbed at times and twisted at times and lies and cheats at times, even though my bride misuses people, misuses me, God says. When God says, my people use my name to do horrible things to other people. But I don't care. I love her anyway. Who is this God of glory? Who is this king of battle? He is strong in battle. Right now, I believe this. And maybe this will make up for the girliness. I believe right now, there is a realm going on that is in battle for each and every one of our souls. You think, well, no, I'm saved. I didn't say that. We can be zombies, dead church. And he's fighting for the happiness, the joy of the Lord. He's... He's fighting for all that, and he's saying, you know what's worse than an unsaved church? A grumpy church. A church that is critical. A church that is legalistic. That's worse than an unsaved church. Because we're given false hope. False freedoms. God's saying, nah, get it right, church. Come to me as you are. Put the pretenses down. Pull off the masks. And let us just understand why we're here. Oh God, we are here for you. We are here for you.